Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, April the 10th, 2019. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. My guest in the first segment is Hendrik de Pachter, and we're going to be talking about the Green Party. The Green Party in British Columbia and the recent uh, changes in their uh, political stance that uh, I welcome finally. But before we start, Jack, I'd like to congratulate you on your recent birthday. Oh, thank you I very understand much. you're about 55 now. Well yeah, done. A little over than that, but... <laughs> Any case, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, when you invited me to appear on the show, what was in my heart was to talk about how, as a longtime Green Party supporter, uh, aware of the party since 1982, voting for the party since 1996, uh, active in constituency association and electoral district association functions for many years. Uh, I uh, was really dismayed with uh, the response on the part of the British Columbia uh, Green Party to the various uh, decisions made by the NDP, particularly as they uh, pertain to the environment and, and all those issues. It seems to me that uh, Norman Spector's analysis that the Green Party was snookered in the, uh, in the negotiations regarding the, um, the CASA agreement uh, that... Uh, and what is the CASA agreement? Oh dear, I've just, uh, I've just blanked on it. Okay. A confidence and, and supply agreement. So that was the agreement that the Green Party and the NDP made? Yes, that was, that was the binding agreement that allowed the Green Party at significant uh, moments to support uh, the NDP in the legislature with their vote. And there were a number of uh, things that the Green Party wanted and achieved in the CASA, but the analysis subsequently is that they sold out too quickly. They were fooled with regards to Site C Dam in particular, and in that regard they somehow had faith that by referring the matter to the BC Utilities Commission, which was the fallback position of the NDP, that the, uh, the, the, there was a reasonable expectation that the BCUC would deem the Site C to be uh, either uh, go forward or stop, and that that would have provided enough information for the NDB to make the right decision based upon uh, significant opposition from uh, scientists, environmentalists, First Nations, and farmers. I'll just interject and say, what the NDP did was a total, in my opinion, betrayal of not only the people of BC and their supporters, but the environment and the planet. I mean, this was, there's no excuse for what they did. And the only thing I can think of is that the party itself is totally corrupt. Everything they said about in opposition was a lie. The real story was, is what happens when they come to power. Here we have LNG, right? So they're actors, and the NDP are good mm -hmm. actors, and, uh, but they don't deserve our right. trust. Well, uh, I, I, I regret to say that I agree with you. And it's, uh, it's uh, clear that the people in the peace thought that John Horgan was really determined to stop Site C. That's what he campaigned on uh, before the election and they gave him their trust and uh, from the moment that Site C was decided upon uh, it stabbed me in the heart, it stabbed you in the heart and at that, from that moment on while it might have been necessary for the BC Green Party to adhere to the CASA uh, there should have been a, a change of tone and a stronger militancy and a willingness for the Green Party to stand up because subsequent to Site C, we've also had very poor movement forward on uh, fish farms. We've got uh, the NDP agreeing to log 1,300 hectares of old growth forest on Vancouver Island. We've got uh, the NDP approving uh, cut blocks in caribou country. And we really have a pretty dismal record on the environment. They will protest. And let's that not even mention done fracking and LNG. No, they, that, that's right. They will protest that they've done a good job. And in that regard, I blame the Green Party for uh, not voicing enough opposition to these uh, events that reached uh, the common person. 
and uh, that uh, they have basically been supportive. I know from uh, correspondence with the BC Green Party after they came out in support of the Clean BC Plan, which doesn't go anywhere near to what we need to face the existential crisis that humanity faces, that they protested and they, and they fought back in their arguments with me. Uh, I'm really dismayed with the, the, the vigorous support that the BC Green Party has given to the Clean BC Plan. There's nothing about deforestation, there's nothing about reforestation, there's nothing about solar, there's nothing about geothermal, there's nothing about wind. Uh, so it's a pathetic document that doesn't even get to the 40% reduction by 2030 and has nothing to say about how we move to the 80% reduction by 2050, which we know is insufficient. We actually need to be uh, at zero use of carbon fuels by 2030. We're never going to make it. And so actually, we have to be there now. So, so yeah, so now, but now would even be better. Yeah. So I think what we really have to do, what we have to face as a society, is mitigating the inevitable crises. And I don't see the Green Party committed to that. They are still committed to the idea of growth inside the Clean BC plan, they're saying, we're going to reduce GHGs, greenhouse gases, but we're going to grow the economy. So there's just a, a fundamental disconnect between what we face as a human collective and what the Green Party is standing up for. And finally, with LNG, with liquid natural gas, the Green Party has shown some spine. And I'm really pleased about that. It's far too late, but I hope it is the uh, a sign of the times to come for the BC Green Party. I don't care if we lose votes. We need a party that stands up for human civilization, for the animals, for clean water, clean air, a clean land. And any party that doesn't have a philosophy that protects these three basics has a false political philosophy. And uh, what I see the BC Green Party has descended into here is a gradualism, is a kind of a progressivism that really doesn't face our collective crisis. So finally, with LNG, I'm seeing some spine, and I'm I must have missed it because I don't even know what happened. Well, if uh, if you look at what's happened in in the legislature, is that in the process of introducing uh, the bill, Bill 10, that that uh, pertains to liquid natural gas and the, the giveaway of $5.3 billion of taxpayer money to uh, the richest oil and gas consortiums in the world, um, the, uh, the Green Party attempted through amendments, uh, through 14 votes, to slow this process down. They did a walkout when the, uh, when the Liberals, this is, this is really amusing, the Liberals introduced an amendment to prevent the NDP from blocking information access to the public. Imagine the, end, the Liberals defending uh, transparency. It's, 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 it's actually amusing. And, and to think that the NDP so were opposed totally to this. Sickening, it would be so they walked out. So they have finally shown some spine. And I hope that they really continue to do so. Now, I know, like, take Adam Olson. He has fought courageously for salmon. But we don't hear about it. It's somehow they also have a failure in communicating their uh, successes or their minimal successes uh, uh, to the public. I get stuff from the Green Party, and I can't find that stuff. So if I'm not finding it, what is the average person who's not politically engaged finding? And so uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see the change of tone. So what can we do? I mean, Well, you know, I think what we, we can do is express our uh, dismay to the, those who are Green Party members can express their dismay to the Green Party and say, do you stand for the planet, or is it all about gradualism? You haven't got to 40% uh, by 2030. We don't know what you have in mind uh, for 2050. They're talking about th an end to internal combustion engines here in BC by 2040, 10 years after Holland, 10 years after Germany, 15 years after Norway. Norway's going to have a fleet of electric planes by 2050. And we are, we are proudly saying by 2040, we're going to have no more internal combustion engines on our roads. And we don't even mean that. We don't. 
<laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it would be nice if we get there, but it's way too well, slow. Well, take something that could happen right now. For, I mean, they can promise anything for 2040. Sure. John Horgan came into, into power and said there's no business case for rail in Victoria. Right. And, and that passed basically no coverage in the media. The media wasn't outraged that we can't have trains, which is exactly what we need. Is there another city in the world that has the track but no train? And not only that, but our own Victoria City Council took out the bridge, so there's no bridge into downtown. This is how crazy our leadership is. I mean, there's lots to rail about, so I'd like to see our, <laughs> our paid railers do something. Well, I, I do think that the, uh, that the Green Party has focused its activities in the legislature, and they're trying to fight the battle in all the committees that they sit on. Three uh, Green Party members sit on 21 committees. It must be a horrible job, very demanding. But what we but need we is need leadership on the, the street. street. That's what I was going to say. We need activity we in the street. We both came to the same word at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And you where know, are they? I well, mean, they have money, they have staff, they have... And, and I don't want to criticize them. Where's the NDP? Which is, happens well, to be the party look, that I'm still look, a member of. I, I think it's okay not to criticize the NDP because I don't believe in them at all. They are just a conventional uh, a capitalist party like the Liberals and the Conservatives. They really tinker with uh, the, the social infrastructure they have here in BC. They have made some small improvements. In, uh, in, in income support programs, yeah. but there's no fundamental change like a guaranteed annual income. They're tinkering with the social services and, yeah. and, and green, some Greens are laudatory of that. And of course, helping people is great, but really we need to move towards survival. You see the kids out there every Friday out in the streets saying, we need to survive, and I don't see that kind of political dynamic from the BC Greens here on the street, and that's what I want. Hendrik, I'm with you. Everybody, wow, it's, uh, ay, 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 you know. <coughs> yes, yeah. it's, uh, and uh, you know, uh, to the extent that the BC Green Party doesn't fight hard, uh, I just keep on experiencing this existential dread. We need people to stand up for the planet, and that's not happening. Yeah, well, good luck to us all because <laughs> uh, I think we're going to need it. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Yeah. Welcome back. It is still Wednesday, April the 10th, 2019. I just want to say, Hendrik and I are going to do like a Hendrik and Jack segment, but I want to start off with a little bit about Kinder Morgan. And wh what I see happening now is more and more in the corporate media. I think they're trying to, again, split Canadians, as they always do. And so there's more and more talk about how the government cares about jobs with SNC-Lavalin, which is Quebec, mm -hmm. but it doesn't care about jobs in Alberta. That's, that's this message that the media is putting out. And the whole fight mm -hmm. over the Kinder Morgan pipeline has basically been about jobs, right? And we're told the environmentalists in British Columbia want to protect the environment that you know, we're harming the people of Alberta because they need the jobs. But the Alberta Federation of Labor opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline at the National Energy Board hearings, the NEB hearings mm -hmm. years ago that mm -hmm. finally gave approval for all of this, for the pipelines. The Alberta Federation of Labor and Unifor, which is the biggest union that represents most of the energy workers in Canada, they both opposed the pipeline because they said it was bad for jobs. Mm -hmm. So here we are years later <coughs> and we're being told by our media and politicians that we should be fighting each other over the issue of jobs when the union said the pipeline is not a good idea because it's bad for jobs. We want to refine the product in Alberta. And I'd like to know really why John Horgan will not say this because it's his best argument if you want to you know, why won't the media say it? Why does the media allow us to think the wrong thing? And say, the only person who said it, that I, the only person I've heard it from, is Elizabeth May. Mm -hmm. And she's been in the media a couple of times saying it, mm -hmm. where I've happened to spot it, and that's it. Well, I think that jobs, jobs, jobs is always the selling point, and that uh, abo uh, the, the Liberals, the Conservatives, and the NDP are prepared to sell 
the future of their grandchildren for jobs now. But it's not job. That's it's the lie. It's not jobs now. It's profit. The lie with uh, the LNG in BC is 10,000 jobs. The analysis is we'll be lucky to get somewhere between 3,500 and 5,500 jobs in BC from that. But who wants a job uh, and a good salary that's going to kill your grandchild? Is that the kind of job you want? Uh, there are plenty of green jobs. There's no shortage of green jobs. Why do we need to have a job that gives you a nice fat house and a nice fat car and kills your grandchild? I don't want that kind of job in my province. And it's interesting that the story we think we're in is not the real story because the unions opposed the pipeline because the unions said it was bad for jobs. <coughs> so well, I salute the Alberta Federation, but I wonder about the, the, uh, some of the unions here in BC who wholeheartedly supported Site C. So the unions are in a dilemma because as often as not they're uh, associated with resource extraction. My own union, the BCGEU, um, I'm it's, it's weird. They have elections that, in my opinion, are completely fraudulent. They have fraudulent elections to elect the leadership mm -hmm. of the BCGEU. Um, I ran for a vice presidency of the union a number of years ago, and as the process went along and I sort of read the bylaws and constitution of, of the union, I thought, what the hell is going mm -hmm. on here? But many, many years later, there's nothing I can do about it, so mm -hmm. it just carries on. And the unions are powerful. The unions could be a voice for working people, but the unions are as undemocratic, or at least my own union, the BCGEU, is as undemocratic as anything else, and so it doesn't represent our interests. It seems to represent the same corporate interests that the NDP represents and everybody well, else represents. Well, I was a member of the HSA and a union shop steward for the HSA, and they were tied at the hip to uh, the BC Fed and to uh, the NDP such that Health Matters, the Health Sciences Association, was not putting forward uh, motions on health, but they were voting on BC Federation of Labor health issues when the HSA should have been the lead union on that. So tied at the hip uh, to the NDP is, is pretty accurate and it's unfortunate because it does foster corruption as we've seen with Site C. Yeah. Um, SNC Lavalin. We have about one minute left. Yeah, oh, how about the absence of dread? Oh, well, <coughs> the absence of dread. Yeah, basically what I was trying to communicate there, Jack, is that when I was a 10-year-old kid, I heard the sirens go off in Montreal in uh, 1962 to warn us of what it would sound like if the, wo if the world went to nuclear war because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And from that moment on, I had a dread in my heart that slowly but surely ebbed with the salt and start, start talks. But now we have a kind of a dread of the, uh, of the environmental destruction and people seem completely oblivious to that. There's no longer a sense of, uh, of anxiety that really helped move forward uh, the struggle to ban the bomb and to try to control nuclear weapons. I don't see the same kind of dread operating anymore in society and I wish it would return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We really need, uh, there are so many things going on and I think we can at least do our best to get out of this mess that we put ourselves in and it's not only environmental, it's economic as well and certainly social. But we well, can't do it we're doomed to try. Yeah. We're doomed to try our best. Well, whether it will succeed or not is not the point. We have to try. And it would be nice if our leadership, both political and media, worked for us, together with us, to make that happen. But unfortunately, they all work for the 1% of the 1%. They're, they're puppets of those people. And so we have to fight through them to get anything done, and we can't do it. Another layer of resistance, yeah. indeed. Hendrik, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. And thank you.